Nodge on Nodge podcast. With your host, Hodgy the Hack. Hello there and welcome to Hodge on Nodge episode 11. Now normally we do these as live streams but this one is a pre-record. <clears throat> Excuse me, frog in the throat. And as you can see I've got Graham Wood with me. Graham Wood is a Greek football expert which gives you a clue as to what we're going to talk about. I have been reliably informed that the deal for Christos Zioulis, Zioulis, um Graham's going to correct me on that in a minute, uh, that the deal for Christos Zioulis is done. And with that, it means that I need to do a podcast so that we can learn what he's all about as a player and what he can bring to Norwich City Football Club. But the rules of football and the rules of engagement of being in the media being as they are, I've got to hold on to this until the transfers are announced. Fun and games, but no circus, as Paddy Davitt would say. And let's go on to the, the main protagonists. I'm obviously the ringmaster. And then, I don't know, if you were in a circus, Graham, what, what, what kind of member of a circus troupe do you think would be? There's a random question to kick off with. <laughs> oh, I'd like to say a strong man, but I haven't got the muscle, mate. So I guess I have to be the bearded lady, maybe. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm working nice. on it. I'm working on it. Not, not, not quite up to your standards yet, but, you know, I'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> You'll get there, mate. You'll get there. Excellent. Well, Graham, tell us a bit about yourself so that the Norwich fans can learn about you. Obviously, you're a, a savant of Greek football. One of my old Eurosport yeah. pals hooked me up with you. I've just been hearing a bit about what you do. But tell the Hodge on Nodge listeners um, why you can tell us about uh, Christos Joulis and Dimitris Yanoulis and correct my pronunciation first off. No, no, your, your pronunciation is spot on. So well played on that. Thank uh, you very much. I'll, I'll make no apologies for being a Geordie and a Newcastle United uh aficionado. Um, That's but, all right, uh, mate. Str st strange combination. So, so, so I've been living in Greece since 2004, where I've been working as a journalist. I've, I've, I've worked for various outlets, basically, mainly Reuters um, and also UEFA. So I'm still working for UEFA right now, covering uh, Greek teams in Europe over here, like doing the matches live and, and, and what have you. So I've been following Greek football, uh, actually, since about 2000, actually. So 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 before, just when Otto Rehagel took over the national team, and, uh, you timed think, that well, did you not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I timed it perfectly. You know, Olympic Games, they just won the uh, the Euro. Uh, and everything was like hunky-dory. Uh, but I think it's all gone downhill since then. So I don't know if it's my fault that I'm here or whatever. But, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so yeah, love Greek football, um, even though it's not up to the standards it was maybe 10 years ago. But uh, uh, still follow it passionately and uh, go to all the games. So, do you follow any one team or another, or is it more of a kind of holistic appreciation? Yeah, well, actually, uh, AK Athens is my kind of uh, uh, first team. Uh, that's a team I got. You know, there was a there was there was a mate of mine at uni who was a who was an avid Ajax fan, and he kind of uh, got me the bug there, Greek guy. And um, but but I also like Pauk as well because, like, you know, with the similarities with Newcastle, you know, they're a northern club, uh, yeah. and their fans and their fans like to take their shirts off, basically. You know. The, <laughs> Every month. Do they, ha so, do they uh, have a Jimmy Five Bellies uh, in Park? Yeah, yeah, I think it's called Stavros, uh, Stavros Seven Bellies. Uh, but, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know they, play, they play in black and white, and you know, they're, yeah. they're, they're a port club and, uh, by the kind of um, by the sea and all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of similarities, let's say, kind of brotherhood. <laughs> <laughs> I would say, that, yeah, obviously, your mates influenced you at uni uh, with, with, with the Ike Athens thing, but I, I would say that surely you've got to be, surely you've got to be a bit of passion for Park there. There's too many oh, yeah. parallels with the Toon Army yeah. um, and, and and those Park fans and and the club itself, of course. So let's kick off by talking about the main man. Now, a lot of Norwich fans are really excited by this Julius transfer because. I mean, the, the word wonder kid is thrown about a bit more liberally these days than perhaps in, in previous eras of football. Um, and it was very much the, the, the kind of go-to jargon term for a wee while. Yeah. But is, would you say that's an accurate appreciation of his game? Is this kid someone that's got the potential to be truly world-class as a footballer? I would say without a doubt. Uh, he's one of the few. There's a lot of good, really good uh, Greek young players coming through. But he's the one who has made the most of an impression and looks like he's got the ability to, to, to become world class, as I say. I mean, at, at, at Park, he has the official nickname, uh, the Golden Boy, uh, you know, not just because of his abilities, nice. obviously, as well, but because he's such a uh, down to earth, really nice guy, you know. 
Uh, so that, that that's also important in terms of the character, I think, of a player. You know, he's, he's not one of these uh, show offs and prima donnas. He he seems to have you know well grounded character. That that is important. Now, one of the I've, obviously because we're doing this a bit differently. Normally, fans get in touch with their comments as they watch live. But I've I've actually put a tweet out asking if anyone's got any questions. And I think it was Jacob Yates said, "What's his story?" And I think that's such a good question. He says, I know nothing about the kid. What's his story? And I understand, Graham, you've obviously watched a lot of these PALC players, so be that Jolis and Yanulis, since they were kids in the youth system. So the, yeah. there's a real knowledge there through the kind of time. So going in a kind of chronology for us and, and, and going in order of, of him sort of growing up through the ranks, can you tell us about Christoph Jolis and this journey to being on the cusp of, of really having a special career? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, well, yeah, man, it's 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 quite a story. I mean, he started at the Park Academy, uh, which is you know as far as as far as youth academies go, they have one of the best in the country. Um, he was just eight years old when he first joined the youth academy uh, from his local club, which was called Doxapenda Lofu. Um, but that's that's a pronunciation uh, I wouldn't go for, mate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Even I struggle with that one, and I'm I'm I'm, I'm supposedly fluent in Greek. Uh, <laughs> So um, from an early age, he, he kind of stood out, you know, with his passion, explosive pace, um, you know, and he had a really, really good eye for goal for, 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 for a really young age. Um, and then, um, so he, he continued to go through the youth ranks. And then I think it was um, an under-12 match against Barcelona at, at, at the Camp Nou, which went uh, viral. Uh, it was then when Pauk actually beat Barcelona. Uh, wow. This under 12 match at the Lenishaw. Is there, is there any recognizable names from the Barcelona team that, that we'd maybe um, recognize now? That's a good question, actually. I need to double check that actually and, and watch the video again or, and, and check the team lineups. But I think definitely there will be. Um, mm -hmm. it, was this, it was this Leonard Johansson uh, tournament in, 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 in 2015. And he right. scored, it was, it was in Stockholm and he scored like 11 goals in five matches. Uh, wow. Yeah. And this was kind of. Whoa, who, and was this, this coming off the of? wing as well? Was that was this coming off the wing in the same position he plays now, or was he up front? He he was playing as kind of a second striker as well. Then he was playing like some okay. of, so, so, some of the games were as a winger in like a four three three kind of uh, formation, and uh, sometimes he was playing up front as well because um, he can play up front as well. But obviously he's he's he, he's quite small in terms of uh, height, so it's it's better for him coming in from like a, a position on one of the flanks. So, yeah. but like sh shortly after that, um, his family had to leave Greece and they moved to Germany because uh, I, I think um, with, without knowing the full story behind that, I, I, I think it was something to do with work, work related reasons and, you know, for financial reasons, his family moved out of Greece. Uh, so then uh, he, he, he spent three years in Germany and then he came back to Pauk in uh, 2018 um, and started playing for the under 17 team. And there, so like, what, what what did he do in his time in Germany then? He was playing at a, he was playing for a team called uh, Rosenborg. Um, okay. Not so the Norwegians. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, well, yeah, exactly. When 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 I saw that, I was like Rosenborg, aren't they from Norway? But yeah, there's actual place in the, in a Germany, a small village as well called Rosenborg. So there you go. Good to know. Useless bit of information for the day. No, um, no, listen, all of this is good because we want to learn about this kid. That's the thing. Like Norwich City fans are some of the most passionate in the world. It's why I've become one or a big part of it. And I think it's a fan base that's ready to embrace a star because we're a club that sells a lot of players for big money, develops them, brings them on. And for that reason, I think this is such a good landing spot. I'll be interested to know your thoughts on that as we progress through the chat. But 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 sticking at this point, Norwich fans want to know as much as they can about this kid. So knowing that he played for um, a German village team that were, or maybe not quite a village team in terms of level, but a team yeah. from a German village that have the same name as Norway's record champions team in Rosenborg, that's a good throwaway fact for a pub quiz at some point. Well, exactly, yeah. Um, so, so, so then he came back um, to Pauk, as I said, in 2018, and then th uh, things just took off from there. I mean, the under-17 uh, side, he was very successful there. He scored, like, I think in his first season back, 29 goals in 25 games. Mm -hmm. And then even though he was younger, he, he was, like, too young, they still moved him up a level so he could play in the under-19 side after that. Um, and then I don't know, uh, this may be a good fact, as well for the for, for the Norwich fans, the under nineteen team is ab absolutely incredibly successful. I mean, they've won uh, 
the title for the last four seasons in a row, and three of those unbeaten. They've gone something like 85 <laughs> without even losing a game. So you can see that the quality of the youth academy. That's why you know players like Janulis and uh, Dimitris Pelkas, who who moved in the summer to uh, Fenerbahce from Pauk when they uh, uh, last summer when they failed to qualify for the Champions League. It, it, there's just a couple of the players. I mean, the youth team is is, is so strong. Um, it's unbelievable, really. So he he continues his growth there, and then during the pandemic, um, they they moved him in to, to train at, at first, you know, to train with the uh, senior team. And then at, at the back end of um, the 2019-20 the season, he had a couple of games in the... Um, uh, so, sorry, the back end of, of the... Um, yeah, I'm getting my it's, all, it's all right. Well, do, do you know what it is, mate? The pandemic has ruined that yeah, it's ruined. usual. Uh, exactly. You, you've got to, you've got to kind of engage your head to think. When was it? Oh yeah, it was that this season or last season. So no, I, I totally sympathise, mate. Yeah, yeah. It was the it, it, it was the end of the ninety uh, the, the 2019 2020 season where he had a couple of games. He made it made his debut in, in the kind of end of season playoffs in Greece, um, and obviously last season was his first full season where he really kind of and. Uh, uh, and the starting team players and broke through, and it's, it's just made such an amazing impact. Well, it's crazy, right? So I'm just—I mean, I'm taking this. Uh, I'll reference the website in case any is wrong, but usually this is yeah. quite reliable. Transfermarkt.co.uk tells us he's played 84 games overall. Um, so that'll be starts and sub appearances combined. He's got one go uh, 37 goals, not one goal, 37 goals and 10 assists. So that's a goal involvement, more than one goal involvement every two games, which is absolutely staggering production for a young kid. And one question, me being the ever sort of uh, present cynic that I am, is why did they take so much time with this kid? Why did they sort of allow him to have that time to to sort of come through the youth ranks, build confidence, build his game before properly throwing him in. Because a lot of clubs, the temptation is to go, right, We've, I mean, Wayne Rooney's an example. So 16-year-old fling yeah. him in the team. Michael Owen, Robbie Keane, so many players over the years. Yeah, yeah. You would say, just throw them in the team. If they're old enough, they're good, uh, if they're good enough, they're old enough. So why did they not do that with, with Cholas? Because it's like they've taken their time and then when he's gone in, he's exploded. So is that just the way that Pauk manage their players, or is there something more? Exactly, to it? it's it's a kind of whole it's a kind of whole uh, philosophy of the Pauk Academy and, and the way the club manages it. Uh, they don't want to uh, throw players in too much, uh, too young at the deep end. Uh, so it's a bit of a different kind, uh, kind of philosophy. And it, it, this also combined with the fact that there was a lot of competition for places then. But then after that, you know, uh, around the time that the Jules, uh, Jules was getting his chance. You know they were looking for something you know different a, a, a spark so but yeah they do tend to manage the young players a bit different they don't they they don't tend to throw them in kind of at, at, at the deep end uh, as easy as as maybe they do in uh, england let's say mm. well that's that, that to be honest I, I really admire that about park and I mean, it'll be interesting for me now because obviously when something comes on your radar, I'm seeing Greek players coming through and if I'm commentating a game, it'll be like, yeah, Pauk. But it's good to know a bit more about the story of their academy, how they manage players. Yeah. And has it... So did you ever have any dealings with this 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 kid in terms of when he was young? Uh, and subsequently, has there been any sort of crossover between you guys in, in interviews or anything like that? Um. I haven't actually interviewed him yet, um, apart from like being in press conferences and stuff. Uh, and that still know. counts. That still yeah. counts. So it gives yeah. you an appreciation in terms of the way he deals with the, the, the yeah, press yeah, of his no, character. He's he's he, he's quite shy. He's a man. He's a boy. I would say a man because he's a man of, of very few words. You know, he chooses his words carefully. A lot of that is partly down to Pauk as a club and the way they operate. You know, they obviously give their players like any club a lot of media training, but they have a really good kind of media team there that kind of manages the play as well but he's such a kind of uh humble uh low-key uh guy you mm -hmm. know he doesn't have the ha, 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 have this profile you know some players just stand out straight away you know with with their kind of um charisma and stuff but he's he i would say he's charismatic in another way of uh, 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 where he's like humble and down to earth in the interview he'll be like 
you, you sometimes struggle to get a few words out of him because you know he's so so quiet and kind of shy. But I think, you know, as he's getting older, I've seen him over the over, over the course of the years, he's interviewed more and stuff, you know, come out of his shell a bit more. But, you know, he's mm-hmm. he's really just a guy, and I, 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 mean, I know it's a cliche, but he's really just a guy who's really focused on his football and, and, and trying to improve. Uh, I, don't really think really I don't think there's no. any harm in that. I don't think there's any harm in that. Now, when it, when it comes to that side of it, you see so many players that, yeah, they're not good in front of a camera. They're quite shy in a social situation. They go on a football pitch. Now, me, I'm the opposite. If I step onto a football pitch, um, maybe a few stone ago, let's be honest, but if I step onto a football pitch, I'm so crazily self-aware that if I take a bad touch, people watching might laugh at me or something like that, and I become yeah. really shy. But you get players that are the opposite. So their thing is that they step onto a football pitch, and it's like, yeah, I just forget the crowds there and I play. Now, I say that most of his football will be played, I'm guessing at the lockdown parameters in Greece, but most of it will be played or have been played at least as a professional in stadiums, maybe all of it, you can, you can correct me on that, where the stands aren't full. In fact, there might be no spectators at all bar the assembled media and club staff. So could that be a factor? And sort of him making the step up to the Premier League, which is obviously um, most people say it's the best league in the world. That of a Bundesliga, I think you can you, you you could make arguments for both. But do you think the fact he's not played in front of massive crowds a lot could be a factor in this, and just how well he takes the jump up to the Premier League? Well, I would think you've you've definitely hit on something there. Um, I think with with Jolis though. I wouldn't think it would be such a factor. I'm going to tell you why. Uh, last season, when Pauk had a major uh, dip in form, um, it's it's no coincidence they they coincided with the dip in form that Jolis had. You know, he played a lot of games, a lot of uh, responsibility was put on his shoulders. You know, mm-hmm. it was easy to forget it was his first full season and he's only 19. Yeah, because it was like he was the player that everyone was looking to to do something when things were going down. You so know, so he has already been in that role where he's like the make something happen. What I think of is the James exactly. McFadden, Scotland era role. It's like the team's rubbish, give the ball to McFadden, hope he scores a 30 yard or a measy run past five players, you know? Exactly. This was the case because, um, you know, Pauk were going through a dodgy uh, patch, re- uh, really dodgy. They, they kind of lost their way in, in terms of their style of play. And uh, they, were, they were relying so, uh, so heavily on, 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 on Jolis and the poor kid, he was one of these players, though. There was other more senior players in the power team who were kind of shying away and not wanting the ball. Not Jolis. He's the kind of player, he'll be having the worst game. Uh, nothing will be going right for him. He'll have a, he'll have a first touch like, like mine, like a baby elephant. But he'll ask for the ball. He'll want it. And he'll want to be in the game. He doesn't shy away. Who, who, who just shies away. That's why I don't think it'll be an issue with, with, with the fans and stuff. Because it's not like he hasn't played in front of uh, fans before. He has played some games. But... I, I really don't think this could be a problem. The only thing that I think could be a problem would be the pace of the the, the pace of the game compared with uh, Greek football, uh, because obviously it's much slower. It's, it's, it's a totally different, uh, in, in, you know, style. That would be the only thing. But I mean, that that would just take some time from to adjust. I think, and, and because he's such a kind of kid who's self-aware of, of what he needs to do, I I don't, I don't think it'll be much of a problem for him to be honest. <laughs> Now, the, a mitigating factor in the next question I'm going to ask is the fact that his old mate, Dimitris Yanoulis, is here. And actually, before I go on to the question I was thinking of, what's the relationship like between those two stretching back? Is there, Because I, I saw so many goals when I was watching the Jolas videos uh, where Yanoulis would be one of the first up. Now, granted, they're on the same flank, right? But he would be one of the first up to celebrate with him. Is there a relationship there both in terms of on the field and off the field? And if so, what can you tell us about that? Definitely, I, I think mainly it's a camaraderie thing from from the Pauk Academy boys. You know, um, to be honest, Yanulis uh, uh, is a bit older, so so he's from the generation of uh, uh, Dimitris uh, Pelkas, uh, Dimitris Limnios. Those those um, three, because of the, all of them were called Dimitris, they were kind of the the, <laughs> the, the, the holy trinity of the of the Pauk Academy youth team, which came through from that generation. So though. Those guys were, were actually closer and have all obviously gone on to different things now as well. But um, with Jolis as well, because he's seen him develop as well f- from obviously when Janulis was there, you know, he was still, he, he, he came back, Jolis had came back in uh, 2018 and was playing for the under-17s and then in the 19s. So he was seeing them because, make, make no mistake, 
the guys at Pauk, the first team, they're they're really interested in the under 17s and the 19s. They go to the games, they mm. go to the training. They have a really kind of good, kind of closely knit kind of family atmosphere in the club. That's uh, so healthy, by the way. That's really oh, yeah. good. It's fantastic, and it's 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 showing now in the way that uh, the coaches, uh, the coaching system is set up, and they're bringing players through slowly, slowly, like a steady stream. They bring them through for preseason training. They introduce them, and and this is great. You know, we're seeing some of the some of the youth players now coming into the team, like uh, Jolis and Mikhailidis, the centre back. Uh, but there's a there's a bunch of others as well. There's uh, uh, Liratsis, who's like a left back, uh, uh, another good player coming through. And Tigaras, who, who's a central midfielder. So I know I'm confusing you with these uh, pronunciations. No, 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 no. no. It's, it's, it's all right. I'm, um, I'm enjoying hearing it because there's a hot bit of talent there. Well, one thing that's noticeable about Stuart Weber, the the Norwich City Sporting Director, is that he is someone that if he has an existing relationship with a club, then he'll go back. You're seeing evidence of that right now in terms of the Janulis and then Jolis. But if Park is an academy where loads of good players are coming through, then I think it makes total sense that Norwich City, given the market that they are shopping in, is has got to be, you, you've got to be getting more bang for your buck than, than Premier League clubs that can just go 30, 40 million pounds than a player. Joe Linton, for example, um, to, to use a Newcastle example. What was he, 50 million or something? 40. 40, 40 it was 40. 40 million for him. Norwich City can't afford to get that wrong, you know? So you, you compare that and then you look at uh, Christos Jolis and, and Norwich City look. I mean, I think part of this will be the economic pressures of football and the fact that Greek football is not awash with loads of money. But do you think Norwich are getting a bit of a bargain in terms of what they're paying for? To, uh, to be honest, if they get Jolis for, for, for 12 million, it's, it's definitely a bargain for me. If you look at the way the transfer market is, you know, oh, okay. There is a risk factor involved. We 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 don't know if he's gonna if he's gonna do as well st straight away. So you know, a lot of these the, these transfers that that the, that the other clubs make uh, in the Joe Linton's of this world, they're trying to guarantee that the, the, they're bringing someone finished and, and ready. But, but but I mean, if you compare that so, something like that, like Joe Linton, forty million for someone like Joe who's you know for me uh, uh, much better eye for goal, much better uh, prospect to put in the team. Even if you use them as, you know, initially as an impact sub, you know, to get to get used to things, then it's it's a much better option. But how, the, the value for money is is, is definitely uh, better. How many games has he played coming off the bench? And I mean, I imagine it was more to towards the start of his time at Park. But was there much of, of a factor of him being that player impacting off the bench as opposed to being the guy that the first team's relying on for, to to make something happen? Because we, we've obviously mentioned that scenario. Hopefully Norwich City have other people that can step in and do that, not to put that burden on the young man's shoulders. But yeah. the idea that I think you're right, it's like get him acclimatised. If Todd Cantwell stays this summer, then that would suggest to me that he will be the understudy to Cantwell. Cantwell will probably go next summer. Then Julius steps up to the first team. That's the that's the progression that I've kind of got in my head and the way that it's going to happen. But that will mean that we're looking to him to be a guy that can come off the bench and make stuff happen. So has he, has he got much of a history of doing that? Yeah, I mean, uh, his first initial appearances were off the bench. But what happened was he was coming off the bench and doing so well, they, could, they couldn't ignore him anymore. And he earned a starting place. And then so he started a lot more games uh, than he has come on as a sub. But then it was... It, so it kind of worked like this. At the start, for the first kind of handful of matches, he was coming on as a sub. And then he earned his uh, starting place. And then he had that dip in form, like towards the, the kind of uh, last third of the season. And then, then he was being used as a as a sub again, uh, but but no, I would say uh, he started a lot more games last season than he came on as a sub simply because they they couldn't ignore him and he was just too too uh, too useful to the team. I mean, you mentioned the, the goals and the assists um, that he that he produced, and uh, but I think Norwich would be wise to do something like that. You know, start off first slowly, but uh, um, bring him off the bench, and then and then see how he goes. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to repeat those stats because I kind of stumbled over them earlier. 84 appearances, 37 goals, 10 assists. One sort of I mean I don't know what the average numbers are for players getting yellow cards in games. 11 yellow cards in there, no red cards. Any questions over discipline or anything like that? Anything that you would consider to be a potential red flag other than just the the typical things of young man acclimatizing to a new style of football in a new country? 
Yeah, no, no, I think it, it, it boils down to what I said about character before. I mean, he's such a level-headed fella. Um, I've never seen him, I mean, I've seen a lot of power games, and I've never seen him kind of lo lose his rag or anything like that. You know, because, I mean, I look at yellow card stats these days, and the things you get yellow cards for sometimes, let, I know. let's be honest, it's it's a bit ridiculous. Uh, but but uh, no, I wouldn't think there were any issues discipline-wise on that side of it. I mean, good, you know, Quite, quite the opposite, as well as those stats you mentioned as well. He was also obviously voted Pauk's uh, MVP for the season last season. And he also won, he, he broke the record. He won like five months in a row. He was MVP of the month. So this was kind of incredible. Wow. Yeah. Right. So, so he's been total talisman stuff. What's he yeah. best at? Describe him as a player stylistically. I think as a player, he's got explosive pace and he, he's got excellent close control and uh, skill on the ball. But uh, he's also got good positional sense in, in terms of picking out his teammates and, and arriving at, 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 at the right place at the right time. So he's one of these exciting, explosive players who, you know, uh, can do something unpredictable, but can also be relied on to do his job as well, you know, tracking back. So he, 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 he's such a hardworking player overall, but I think... The, the thing that makes him stand out is that his is, is pace, his is close control and his skill. Yeah. And so eye, And obviously the eye for goal that you mentioned because uh, scoring as many goals as he has from virtually a, a, a forward position on one of the flanks is uh, pretty impressive stuff. Oh, massively so. What kind of system do Park play? They're, they were playing a 4-3-3 uh, four, three, three system last Excellent. year. Excellent. We've just they're changed to that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've just changed to that for the new season. We, we've been playing four two three one for the for the last three, uh, four actually under Daniel Farka. And mm -hmm. I think because of the way that it went last time we were in the Premier League, I think he's thought right. I need to construct this a bit differently this season. And I think we're going to play four three three and maybe at times three at the back with wing backs. Um, is there any question that Jules could play in that kind of role, or do you think that that putting him in a wing back position would be asking too much of his abilities? To, to, to be honest, um, I, I think we, we, we'd be asking to, uh, too much of him. I haven't yeah. seen him do much defending in, in terms of, you say, proper defending as a wing back. Yeah. I, I, I mean, he, he tracks back and gets back like brilliantly, but I wouldn't put him there. And, and the second reason would be it would be, it would be a waste. No, 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 that, that's it. I think it will be his old mate that will probably occupy that role, to be honest. But I just thought yeah, it was Janulis, worth asking. Janulis is perfect for that because as, as the Noids guys will have seen, the Noids fans... He's a player with a lot of talent. He's very quick. He's very attack-minded. Um, and he, he's also a player, uh, like so many times for Pauk, when things weren't going well, they'd give him the ball and say, just run the length of the pitch and, and, try, <laughs> and try and give an assist to someone, you know? And it's, it's very rare that teams ask a fullback to do that kind of role. But, you know, he, he had that kind of role when he was at Pauk. So I, I think it's been a master in the Premier League. I think it's been a masterstroke giving him the six months to bed in. I honestly yeah. think that was just such a clever piece of business because now he's going into the Premier League and he's one of those players that this might sound like a misnomer to a lot of people, but I think he's going to be a better Premier League fullback than a Championship fullback because I just think that the the pace of the game, the way that the Premier League team's set up tactically, is just going to play right into his hands. And I'm so, so excited to see what Yanulis does. And also quite. Good. Because uh, Newcastle were interested in him apparently, but we we didn't want to pay the money, and it's like I was absolutely gutted. I was like, how can they not see this, you know? And then when I saw Norwich, I was like, look look at that, well done Norwich, you know, excellent. Uh, on um, on Sky Sports, you get a little banner at the side of the screen, and it's like players in. And and today I was looking at it, and it said Newcastle United players in. Big picture of Steve Bruce, <laughs> none. The word none, and then Norwich City with this sort of list, which is is going to, I think, is going to grow over the next few days with Josh Sargent, Brandon Williams, and and obviously who we are talking about today in in, in Jolis. Um, just to go back to that sort of you know Jolis sort of link up and, and partnership, how vital do you really think that's going to be? Because for me, that strikes me as potentially the, the something that figured in the decision-making to actually push ahead with this deal is, look, we know that there are risks and questions with a young kid, someone that, let's be honest, he's played less than 100 professional games. So again, making the jump from the Greek League to the Premier League with that, albeit with a bit of European experience and whatever, that's 
that's something that you, you kind of think, right, mm, maybe too many question marks to go through with it. But if you've got someone that knows him, has played with him, not just that, but also dovetailed on that flank with him previously, yeah. I just think that that's maybe what's sort of pushed this on to the point that it's, it's been completed. Would you agree? I think, yeah, I think you summed it up perfectly there, to be honest, uh, uh, Stuart, because uh, it, it's like I say, not only is it good on a personal level, because, you know, they're both Greeks. Uh, let's face it, uh, it, it you know, Greek is, uh, Greeks as characters, some of them find it very difficult to settle in the UK for, for many reasons. You know, mainly the climate, <laughs> as we know. Um, and they should try Scotland rather than East Anglia. I mean, <laughs> goodness me. Yeah, yeah. I remember it was a. Uh, you remember a, a, a player called Yorgatos who played uh, for Olympiakos and Ike, and he went to Inter, and he he had a great partnership with uh, sending I over do. crosses for Christian Vieri. I remember he he came back. He wanted to come back to Greece, and what what was the reason? He said he missed. He missed uh, going out for coffee with his with his friends in the southern suburbs. <laughs> that, that, that's so, a very good reason. There's actually there's a good story in Norwich City when they signed Johnny Housen um, years ago now, uh, over a decade. When they signed Johnny Housen, there was an interview with Housen, and they were like, "So, so what made you go to Norwich?" And he's like, "Yeah, I really like fly fishing, and and the broads is great for that." And I thought. Yeah, the Norfolk Broads and fly fishing is the best reason I've ever heard for a player joining a football club. Brilliant. Yeah, but 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 like you say, yeah, yeah, they played together in the past, and 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 they're both Greek, so so it'll help them kind of uh, they'll help each other out both on a personal level, and yeah, they can definitely play together, and they're both really attack minded players that, that that can feed off each other and play together. So it would be great to see them both playing down the left hand side for Norwich at, at, at <laughs> yeah. some stage. I'm I'm massively excited about the potential of that, and I, I just think for for all of the off field stuff as well, having someone that's been there and done it for six months, <coughs> excuse me, absolutely massive, uh, and and that's that's going to be good for that young kid. I, I, I think. What do you think in terms of Norwich City as a landing spot then? Um, because obviously you're invested in this young guy's story. You want to see him go on and do well. Mm. What do you think in terms of Norwich City as a landing spot? Do you think it's a, a good place for his next move or, or did you have something else in mind for him? I think I I, I was really shocked, actually, and surprised when I heard the news that that, that, that this move was being talked about. Um, and, and I talked to the guys at uh, Pauk, you know, because I know them quite well, the guys who work in the uh, press department and uh, the, the kind of uh, audiovisual guys and all this kind of stuff. And uh, they, they, they're shocked as well. No one wants to see him leave, to be honest, you know, because he's such a valuable uh, player and, and, and such a great guy. Um, but I think if I had to choose somewhere for, uh, for him to go, um, you know, Newcastle would have been my first, <laughs> of course. Uh, preference, but you know, let's not talk about our youth setup and and the way we handle things because we're we're not a club to be modelled by, uh, by any stretch of anyone's imagination right now with the guy who we have in charge. But I think Norwich have a really, really, really nice uh, setup. They have a good philosophy at the club, uh, and, and and they're traditionally one of the uh, kind of well-known clubs in the UK. Um, and I think the the this all combines and it's not like a massive place as well it's it's not a place where he's going to be kind of um i don't think too much is going to be expected of him okay people are going to have expectations but you know then they're not going to be they're not going to be expecting him to be uh ibrahimovic or something like this you know um <laughs> so i think it's, it's it's a perfect landing spot to be honest um if you had to choose you know best for him to kind of sl uh, slowly get acclimatized to, to, to life in the premier league i think and when it's, he stopped, it's exciting too because they're on the back of a promotion. So there's a lot of kind of good vibes now around the club and a lot of kind of op optimism. So I think this helps as well. Yeah, I think the other good thing is he's coming into a squad that's that's like armed itself with a bit more experience and quality, yeah. I think, going into this Premier League campaign. So I think that's, and, and again, talking about arming with quality, he he very much factors into that, however however long it takes him to, to properly settle. In terms of this Latin thing, when I'll begin to worry is when he starts tweeting and referring to himself as Christos. Um, <laughs> that, that's where we can begin to begin to worry that he's maybe getting a bit carried away. Um, just in terms of the, the, the price tag, which I mean, if, if this goes through, because obviously we're recording this on the premise that it does, then Norwich City um, are going to be paying a record fee for this kid. Now, yeah. do you think that factor 
is going to weigh on his shoulders at all? Or do you think that he's sort of seamlessly stepped into to Park's team and, and just, as I say, exploded? It's the only word I can really say that does it justice. Do you think that that experience of already having been the talisman and the, the guy that's expected to make stuff happen as a teenager for one of the biggest teams in Greece is going to stand him in good stead in terms of being Norwich City's record incoming transfer? Yeah, definitely. I I don't think he's a he's a guy who's going to be faced by uh, price tag. Um, you know, it may, uh, 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 may weigh, weigh on his mind a little bit, but um, I think as soon as he gets over there, um, if the move goes through, obviously, and he gets integrated into the squad, he won't even think about it. You know, it, it comes back to that that what I was telling you about him uh, about him being a low key kind of laid back uh, character. Uh, uh, very hard working as well. One of the hardest working in terms of training. Uh, uh, see, that's really so, important, I think, because I know Daniel Farker and his coaching staff really value players that apply themselves, you know, and I think that that element of his character, Norwich City place a big emphasis on the characters that they bring in as much yeah. as the quality of player. They're not just looking at sort of scouting what he does on the field. It's what's he like off the field? Will he come in and be a positive influence in the dressing room? And I'm sure they've probably spoken to Dimitris Yanoulis about him to get his take on him because he's obviously a trusted member of the squad now. So... I think that will have factored. Now, just in terms of his character, everything that you're saying to me, hard working, down to earth, not really phased by anything too much, it seems like you're onto a winner character wise as well as ability wise. Oh, yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely. No. I wanted to ask a question if I could about uh, uh, and and uh what's what's his kind of has he become one of the kind of key figures in 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 in, in the dressing room? Because at uh Pauk, you know, he was the kind of life and soul of the dressing room. He was the he he was the official DJ uh, in charge of music in the dressing room before matches and stuff, and on the team coach and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know. Has this followed through to Norwich? Have they allowed him to, to put any Greek music on or like that? <laughs> so hang on, right before I answer your question, he's the official DJ. What's he playing like? Because when I think of Greek music, I just think of a Greek wedding. So I might be wrong in that. But what kind of music is he into if he's the DJ of choice? Yeah. Yeah, uh, very bad. This kind of very bad Greek music, actually. Oh, <laughs> and I Greek, pop, Greek pop music as well. So they Oof. probably haven't allowed him to play any yet. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've got, I've got Eurovision flashing in my eyes now in the back of my mind. Uh, I, I, I don't think he will have been permitted to do that. I don't think he holds enough sway in the dressing room yet, room yet to pollute people's ears with that kind of stuff. <laughs> so uh, that's that's brilliant to know, though, mate. So Dimitris Yanou, DJ Dimitris, is that yeah, is that yeah. what we're getting at? Or DJ but, Yanni? But, <laughs> um, no, brilliant. Um, I don't think he's doing that yet. I wonder now that he's got his sort of, uh, well, if he's the DJ, then we'll call Christos the MC. Then if, uh, maybe together they can, they can sort of push that angle a bit more. But um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bigger sense than just the music, I, I, I don't think we've maybe quite seen him get to that sort of stature in the dressing room. Now, I'm, I'm obviously not part of that dressing room. I'm not as close to it as I was when I lived down in Norfolk. But I think some of those sides of his character are, are probably maybe being seen in the dressing room. And the thing is, it's a dressing room that contains, or, or sorry, in the training ground, I was going to say, in the, it's a dressing room that contains the likes of Tim Krill, Timu Puki, Grant Hanley, yeah. so many big figures, you know? Yeah. And I think they're going to be the elder statesman of the dressing room because you know this is still relatively young himself. So that's, yeah, yeah. That, that's an important factor. But depending on how long he stays at Norwich City, I think he will definitely do that because I think the one thing that I would say, and that this is going to be interesting to note in terms of body language and just the way that they, they sort of carry themselves, Christos Julis is still a teenager. We, we need to yeah. emphasize that fact. Yanulis came in to Norwich City and immediately looked like a man in the team. Like, there was no question that this was sort of a talented young fullback coming from Europe, anything like that. He's still quite young, as we say. Yeah. He just came in and it was like, it was seamless, you know? It was, it was, it was seamless. And I think he was solid, if unspectacular, yeah. in terms of that first season of the Championship. But as I say, I'm so excited about him this season. I think he's going to be absolutely magnificent for Norwich City and could be one of the top three in player of the year if he has the season that I expect him to. So we'll come back to that prediction, Hodge on Nodge fans, at the end of the season. And you can laugh at me or say, ah, oh, Hodge, he knows what he's talking about. Um, probably the former, I would add. But yeah, um, I'm excited to see about Yanulis. What, what can you tell us about him that we might not already know, other than the fact he's a terrible DJ? <laughs> 
Well, um, I know that, um, as I was mentioning, he, he was kind of one of the um, life and soul of the dressing room, uh, always bringing uh, good uh, good vibes and wanting to have a laugh. Um, um, but he's obviously a serious uh, footballer as well, as you said. Um, I was going to say, yeah, about a month ago, um, because I do a bit of freelance uh, uh, work for uh, Pauk, uh, for their website and for the for their TV channel. And they did an interview with them, uh, like a virtual interview. And I, and, I, and I was translating some of the quotes and they were just talking about uh, some of his initial reactions about life, you, you know, at Norwich and about life mm-hmm. in England. And, I, and, and the main thing that came through there was like, he was really keen to, to get his language skills up to scratch. Uh, like he's kind of like, you know, but he, he, he was humble about that and was saying it's, you know, on me to uh, get my language skills a bit better so I can integrate uh, but, and, and, and they were asking him if he could understand what everyone was saying. He's like, well, to be honest, some of the Scottish players, I can't understand a word. <laughs> uh, so, so I was laughing at that because I was like, yeah, um, don't worry. You know, I'm, I'm from the northeast of England and, you know, I, I struggle to understand, un, 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 understand some of my buddies from, uh, from Scotland as well, from God's country. Um, so, yeah, but he, he was saying it's, it's just been tough. It, it was a bit tough for him uh, at the start. Um, to kind of in, uh, to kind of integrate on that aspect, and in terms of playing wise, he found the pace of the game a, l- a lot faster than he needed to to adjust to that, and he he just wanted to work hard to to, to try and improve. But all around, he's he, he's a top lad as well. He's uh, he's always uh, willing to do media interviews. Uh, he never shies away from stuff like that. He's not one of these who puts his headphones on and just disappears. Um, yeah, no, that, that that's always really good. nice kid to have around, basically, and a good player. No, no, really good player, and I think the, I mean, from from our perspective in the media, someone that that actually engages in in the mix zone. Uh, I know you do stuff for UEFA is is obviously massive, and it does seem that there's a bit of personality about him. But I do get the impression, similar to what you're saying from those quotes, which, by the way, send me that article, and I'll make sure to share it in case people want yeah, to yeah. read it after this after this podcast. Um, but with the um, with that sort of side of his personality and and the quotes, I think. I think you've seen someone that at the moment is just not trying to get above their station yet, you know, doing the job that's meant of him. And I think as his language skills grow, as his confidence grows, his camaraderie with his teammates grows, I think you're going to see a player that truly blossoms. And I expect that process to happen maybe over the first six months of this season and then for him to to be a superb Premier League player. Uh, by a, a, definitely a very, very solid and serviceable one by the end of the campaign. And I'm excited to see his development almost a wee bit more than Cholis because I think he's more ready to just go and do it right from the start. Whereas Cholis, I'm, I'm managing expectations. And I mean, I see him as a judge him after 24 months rather than 12. Would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. No qualms with any of your comments there. Totally. Totally uh, agree. And you me. understood everything I said, right? Of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, nice one. Um, Graham, I've not got much more to ask you, so I'm just going to go to a couple of fan questions uh, that I had in on my, my, my Twitter. Um, Mark Jones is asking, where do you think we'll play him, Hodge? And uh, the formation for us this season, in your opinion, I've already said that's 4-3-3. And I think we'll probably agree on this, but I will defer to the man to my left uh, in terms of what position he's he's going to play. But I imagine it will be coming in off the left. But where else can he play as well? Well, he's actually, the good thing is, an, another uh, great thing about uh, Tolis is that he, he can, he's good with both feet. Uh, so he can play down the right as well. But I think his strongest position is down the left. You know, some of the best goals he scored, if you have a look at some of the goals on, on uh, YouTube and stuff, it's, it's, uh, have been when he's been surging down the left, cutting in. And then curling one into the top corner, bottom corner, or you know the near post, he can do all of those things. So I think a, a, attacking down the left hand side is his uh, is his uh, best position. Best position. Now, just actually on that as a weakness supplement, you said good with both feet. Presumably, best role is an inside forward coming in off the left. But yeah. what kind of goals does he score as well? Like, I mean, I've obviously looked look at a few videos, but I mean, the typical goal I imagine is the sort of standard defender up, curl it round him and the keeper into the far corners. Of what I've got in my head. But can he score like thirty yarders? Can he score like a variety of uh, different types of goal? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you have a look at his goals reel, uh, his his uh, favourite kind of goal is is that what I was saying? Coming down the left, cut, uh, cutting in, 
and 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 kind of scoring with the diagonal strike in either the top corner or under the keeper, but because his movement of of the ball is so good as well, he's he, he's one of these players who'll who'll make a diagonal run, and if you've got a midfielder who can uh, send over either a, a you know a through ball, a, a high ball or a, or a low ball, he like he 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 loves to latch onto those like Michael Owen style and, and kind of toe poker past the keeper. These kind of goals. Oh, but, nice. Um, yeah, yeah. I haven't seen him score many headers, <laughs> if I'm honest. You know, th that that's not his strong point. But, you know, he does put his head in, uh, you know, when, when there's a chance there. He always attacks the ball and that's all he can ask of a forward, isn't it? Uh, so, yeah. I mean, he's, I mean, he's by no stretch of any man's imagination, he, he's not a typ he's not a typical striker. Let's, let's make it like that. He's a forward. Uh, for, uh, forward cross winger, let's say, uh, you know, this new kind of style of player that the that, 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 that teams have to, to play on the flanks. But yeah, his, 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 his favorite kind of goals are those ones that, that you mentioned at the start, but he's also good at like racing through and latching onto something and, and obviously scoring goals from close range as well if someone can get a crossover. Quite, quite composed when, because you know, you get these players yeah. that are good if they've got five men round about them and just find the impossible angle to score. And then you get guys, those same kind of players are the ones that if they run clean through, don't have the composure to either dink the keeper or, or slot it under him. Has he got yeah. a bit of that that oh, yeah. cold eyed assassin bit as well? Yeah, I've I've got to find that um, uh, who it was against. I don't remember the the, the 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 team now, but I'll try and find the video and, and send it to you. There's one goal where there's a cross comes right over to him at the back post, and he brings it down bird camp esque with one touch, and then he kind of tricks the defender, and then the goalkeeper comes out and just just at the right angle from an acute angle is the goalkeeper's trying to get the ball at his feet he just dinks it over him so he's got and I've, I've i've seen him i've seen him score a couple of goals like that he's definitely has composure he's like a he's like an executioner you know in terms of his finishing so um, La last one on that kind of score of, of like specific abilities uh crossing and terms of sort of lateral passing has he got a bit of that in his game as well in terms of the the vision and the ability to execute the pass or or the the, the swung in cross yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, obviously, as, as you see by his assist ratio, more, uh, most of them have come from like this, these kind of crosses from the left, you know, the like in-swinging cross. Um, and also so is that, is, that, is that curled in the air or a low-drilled cross or a kind of mix? It, it's a kind of mix, but most of them have been kind of uh, in the air, uh, you know, because okay. they have obviously Pauk play with a, a central centre forward. So the, the, the idea obviously is every time they're breaking quickly, to, to, to try and send over a high cross. But it's, I, I've also seen him do some smart little passes, you know, threading the ball through on the edge of the box when it's, uh, you know, thinking quick and hitting a ball with like, like a first-time pass. I haven't I seen him do good. these kind of long raking uh, passes. I think that's one area of his game that, that, that perhaps he needs to kind of work on. Uh, but I mean... Uh, Co know. Combination plays strong though, because I think that yeah. if, you, if you don't have that, if you can do the combination play element, then that kind of mitigates that a little bit. So yeah. I think that's that's obviously good to hear. Sorry, I do have one other thing. Can he hit a set piece? Uh, he, can, he can hit a set piece because there's usually other players who are, who are uh, ahead of him. He didn't get that much of an opportunity at uh, Pauk, but I have seen him hit, especially for the under-19 team, I have, I have seen him... Uh, bit, being the free kick taker, you know, usually it'll be the, the when the ball's kind of you know close to the edge of the box on the right hand side of the box, so it's a left foot is you know curling it either side of the uh, uh, wall, as it were. But yeah, he he didn't take. Uh, I don't think I remember him scoring or even taking any free kicks for the Pauk first team. Yeah, any corners? Let's swung in. Uh, corners? Really. No, no, I haven't seen him take corners either. No, interesting. It's just it's always yeah, worth yeah. asking these things because it's it's good to get an appreciation of who can do what in terms of the greater structure of the squad before they come in. Um, final question. Actually, we do have one other fan question that I was going to ask. Um, which was, uh, do do you expect him to come in and start on the bench and gradually be introduced as we were kind of alluding to earlier? And um, Peaky uh, NCFC also says, if he's a starter, who does he replace? You would imagine it would be Todd Cantwell and that Todd's yeah. the first pick on the left, but Todd can maybe shift to the right. There's a few ways Norwich City could juggle it. But the, the, the first bit of that question, do you expect him to come in and start or be on the bench and gradually be introduced? Do yeah, I think, you, I think as you rightly said, Norwich have made some good dealings in, in, in the transfer market. So they have got some, some experienced players and the squad's been beefed up quite, quite a bit. So to uh, to be honest, I wouldn't expect them to start straight away. I would expect them, as we mentioned earlier in the uh, show, 
that he'd start, you know, maybe you uh, being used as an impact uh, sub or understudy to uh, Cantwell. Um, but, but then they may see if he does well in training and, and, and they see that, you know, he's he's ready, they may they may give him a go. But now I wouldn't expect to see him starting right away. Um, I should ask this earlier because there was a better point to ask this question, but they're all just occurring to me now before we finish up. Um, what's the reaction been like generally in Greece to um, going to Norwich specifically, which I should have asked after I asked you about Norwich as a destination. But what's the reaction been from, from the public and from the Greek media? Yeah, I mean, the Greek media, uh, uh, obviously, um, uh, surprised that um, that Cholis would leave Pau. That That's the main thing that they're focused on, like, oh, like, will really? Pau let him go? You know, that's that, that, that's a big ah. thing. Uh, they focus on that, you know, because Pau are the kind of time where they, you know, they won the league a couple of seasons ago, but... Uh, they, re they really struggled last year uh, to match Olympiacos. So all, all the focus is, 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 is about that. You know, Pauk have lost a lot of players over the last couple of years who've been an integral part of the squad when they won the league. Um, so most of the talk has been focused on that. But they 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 were a bit they were a bit surprised that they said I, I did see some articles like referring to the fact that you know oh, it's it's how come it's uh, Norwich when. You know, other clubs like you know Man United were interested in all this kind of stuff, and like, but um, the, they're also focusing on on the the side that it's good for kind of Greek football if you know players keep keep getting taken away and and uh, develop their careers in the UK because the Greek Championship is 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 so bad right now. So the the, the kind of so wherever they go, as long as it's to you know, somewhere like the, like the Premier League or in Germany, because look, because a lot of Greek players go to the Bundesliga, of course, uh, as well. Um, so yeah, that's that's been the kind of main reaction. Uh, I imagine I the 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 Yanulis thing makes the the angle a bit stronger as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. The uh, the they were talking about uh, obviously if there's been some conversations between uh, Yanulis and and Julius about. Uh, Norwich and all, and, and, and all that kind of stuff, and and for what I know, obviously Janulis has has only got positive things to 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 report so far about his experiences. So, uh, yeah, imagine conversations have happened at both ends of that. So they'll have spoken to Janulis about Julius, like I, I sort of mentioned earlier. But also, Christos is going to ring up his old mate and say, "Right, what's it like there?" And like, if if it was a bag of nails as a football club, then I'm pretty sure he would have. I got his agent to, to sort of focus elsewhere in terms of the negotiations, you know. Um, yeah. I, I think I, I can understand the surprise, though, uh, but I also think it's evidence of the the allure of, of Norwich City now as a, as a club. I think loads of players are looking at it and they're looking at, like, the, the story of an Emi Buendia, where he's mm. gone on, he's developed his game, he's got a move to Aston Villa, which a lot of people thought it might be a bigger club, but I'm very much of the subscribe to the kind of mentality that if he does two years at Villa, he's going to be a Champions League player for most of the rest of his career. So I, I think that's Buendia's ceiling as a player is, is right at the very top. On that note, and nice question to kind of finish on, we at Norwich City got to enjoy a, a truly world-class player, albeit with a few sort of wrinkles in his game that he needed ironed out. And then obviously as he cleaned up his discipline and, and got his focus bang on for every game, obviously he moved on. But with Emi Buendia, Norwich City fans were treated to a truly world-class footballer that we got. He just lifted bums off seats and hmm. made going to Carroll Road to watch a game, uh, which fortunately fans are getting back in now. He, he just made that experience truly special. And it was it was really a privilege to watch him play football. With uh, Julius, hmm. do you think that that same thing is true, that he's going to be a player that, that has world-class potential, which you have said he does uh, earlier, but do you think that this move will go well and that he will be a player that will truly energise Carrow Road and, and get the, the stadium properly crackling with atmosphere? I think so, definitely. I mean, I can't see how we wouldn't because all the all the ingredients are there. Um, I mean, as I said before, he might not have this kind of charismatic character. As you said, he's, he can be quite shy and stuff, but this this may change with, with uh, time and... Uh, and if, if he's given an opportunity, but I think he's the kind of player I can only I can only really see his, his career going in one direction, and that's like all the way to the top, you know. Because there's no other player like him, kind of with the abilities that he has, that's that's that scored the goals and 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 made the impact he has at 
at, 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 at this stage of his career. So I definitely have high high hopes from him. Absolutely loved to see him do well, and 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 I would love to see Norwich do well as well because they're they're one of the clubs who belong in the Premier League. Um, so clap that yeah, man, yeah. Norwich fans! <laughs> clap that man! Yeah. Well, no, oh, I, I hope we manage to beat you guys tomorrow uh, at, at uh, St James's Park. So, but, I, uh, but but I hope that's the only defeat you'll have. <laughs> well, mate, that, that that sounds good enough to me. Um, just on the, uh, the sort of last one on on Julius, because that was going to be my last one. But if you were a betting man, how long till he settles and shows that that class that you're talking about? I don't know. I mean, he's he is still teenage. He's still a teenager, as we said, and you know these things can be a bit unpredictable, but. You know, I would I would give him three months, and then uh, and uh, three months would be the kind of uh, time where where I would say, you know, just just let him give him some time just to settle in. I mean, he may I may eat my words. He may be given a chance right from the off, and I would love to see that. You know, to see him do well from the off. Sometimes this happens when if 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 they sign him and like a new player, new season. Uh, sometimes this can happen. I hope that's the case. But yeah, I would say three months, and then he could settle in nicely. I think it depends if Todd Cantwell stays or not, if I'm honest with you, Graham. I think that's going to be the the, the ter- determining factor in terms of whether he's in the first team from the very start or not. But, yeah, I mean, it sounds like we've got an exciting one in our hands. And I'd be interested to to see, actually, how he copes with settling with the family-wise in the new players because he, he, he is a boy that the family is really important to him. You know, it might be a cliche and obvious thing to say, but in Greece, it's, it's, it's a bit different here, you know. Uh, the family culture, you know, you have grandparents living with the with the family uh, in, in, in most cases across the country. And, and I know he's a kid who's really close to his family. So it'd be interesting to see how he settles being away from his, his kind of hometown. I mean, he's done it before at a young age in, in uh, Germany. But, uh, you know, things are a bit different now. I think he was kind of settling, getting into being a Pauk and establishing himself. And now all of a sudden he's going to be moving. So that, that could be a factor. But I think, as I said, his character is such that he, he should be able to settle in. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be interesting. But one thing that I think bodes really well is Norwich City is a family club, and mm. Norfolk as a as a county, the 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 character that it's got and the character that the people have, I think will really suit someone where that's their first priority, you know. Yeah. And I, I mean, I know I loved it when I when I lived down there. But yes, we're nearly up to the hour mark, Graham. So I think it's okay. time for us to probably bid farewell for today. Actually, I'm getting a train to Birmingham in about 35 minutes and I've still to finish packing my bag, so I better go. But okay. um, mate, thank you so much for, um, for joining us no today. That, that, that was a really good pod and it's excellent to get an appreciation of... The, the way that the Greeks look at it, someone's ex, like yourself, someone who's got an expert opinion that's that's known both him and Janoulis since they were kids, and I think that's that's really good for Norwich fans to get. And what I will ask is, um, will you be happy to come back on if there's any reason that we need to focus on the oh, yeah, the, the Greek gods once again? Definitely, definitely. No, ah, I, good. In, in the ways that all enjoyed it. No, thank you very much, my friend. Um, and to all the Hodge on Nodge listeners who will have benefited from two quick podcasts in succession after a long hiatus, and then this one, which will be released as soon as the signing is announced, um, as long as I can get the video edited in time, then that will be all well and good. But thank you very much to all of my loyal listeners on the podcast app, all of my loyal viewers on YouTube and on Twitter and on the various other places that I do stream these videos. I'm very grateful. If you have enjoyed them, then please do subscribe, be it on the podcast player, on YouTube. Uh, if you do subscribe on YouTube, remember to hit the wee bell for notifications, then you'll know if I'm releasing new videos. And if you've enjoyed this, then share it like uh, and make sure and give us a bit of love in whatever way you do see fit but thank you very much to Graham on my left thank you very much to all of you for watching and listening and all that remains for me to say to finish up as always is in fact we'll do it in Greek do you know how to say on the ball city in Greek Graham on the ball city in Greek um Panos de Bala City. <laughs> Panos de Bala City. <laughs>